Shalom and welcome again to this week's edition of Seekers and Meeting, the podcast and TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Adras. We thank you for joining us on what we hope will be a very interesting and exciting conversation uh, with two very, very interesting and exciting guests we have for you today. As you know, these podcasts are designed to discuss aspect and the implications of longevity on our families, our communities, and our own selves. If you'd like to make a comment or suggestion, to us, please email me at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. Uh, it is with a great deal of pleasure that we welcome to uh, the microphones and screens today, um, Mr. Robert Wolf, Bob Wolf, the senior advisor to uh, the SC Group, um, who comes to us with many, many, well, a few years of uh, experience and expertise in the field of aging, uh, and uh, Dr. Amy Ehrlich uh, coming to us from Montefiore Hospital in the beautiful Bronx, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they are, along with Barry Eckert, a editors of a very, very interesting, this perhaps may not be a book that you're going to take to the beach, um, but it is a very, very important book called A Comprehensive Guide to Safety and Aging, Minimizing Risk, Maximizing Security. So, lots to talk about. Uh, Bob, Dr. Ehrlich, welcome. Welcome to Secrets of Meaning. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, what was the genesis of this book? This is a very, very comprehensive book of essays um, covering a whole variety of issues on the subtitle of health and safety. Uh, what what motivated you to do this? What and and is this is is this for lay people? Is this for professionals? Talk to me about the why and the wherefore of this book. So, so Richard, what happened was um, one of the privileges of being a program officer at a foundation is I deal that focuses on the needs of older adults is that I see a lot of different things. I am not in one specific area of specialty. And I had the experience one week of going from a falls prevention program to an elder abuse prevention program. And I woke up in the middle of the night and said, wait a second, those are both older adult safety issues. When my daughter was a baby, I had books on keeping my child safe. I don't ever remember seeing a book on keeping older adults safe. I did hours of trolling through the web, not a single book. So the original impetus was to create a book for older adults and their caregivers. And, but publishers were not interested. Publishers said, and almost every publisher said the exact same thing to me as if they had rehearsed it. My mother doesn't listen to me. She's not taking advice from me. She's not going to read the book. She's never going to do anything. So they said, who's going to buy and read this book? Uh, this was extremely distressing to me. It was ages. I got a few older adults don't read, which is also not true. Um, and I really wanted to do this book. Second piece is that as you, I'm sure, are aware, caring for older adults properly in many areas, domains, has increasingly become a team sport. I'm sure you've done shows on palliative care. It takes a team. It takes a social worker. It takes a chaplain. It takes a nurse. It takes doctors. Elder abuse. The New York Center for Elder Abuse has DAs, social workers, doctors, it's a team, and increasingly that is true, and it is particularly true for issues that impact on safety. I'll just do one, and Dr. Ehrlich has much greater expertise in medical issues than I do, but one of the things that was also an impetus to write the book is I went to a wonderful not-for-profit in New York City called the Center for Hearing and Communication. I know them well. I got there. They were very sad the day I arrived. I said, what happened? And they said one of their clients 
checked their carbon monoxide detector, it worked perfectly, and then, like, how many thousands, millions of older adults took out their hearing aids and slept through the alarm and died. So, um, but just to go back to the issue of hearing, so you can go to an audiologist and check your hearing, but hearing has an impact on falls. It has an impact on depression. It has, so if you are, we want professionals like audiologists to be aware of that they can't just focus on, yes, that person needs a hearing aid, doesn't need a hearing aid. They need to understand the other aspects of safety that relate to their specialty. So, Dr. Ehrlich, uh, the, the, um, a lot in the book, you, you, you talk about, um, age friendly care. And then we also hear the phrase patient centered care. And Bob is talking about to coin, a, you know, to use another popular phrase, a holistic approach to this new life stage called caregiver. And it, and it is a new life stage. Could, could you just walk us through, is there a difference between patient-centered care or age-friendly care? So <laughs> you, that's a great question. So I'm a geriatrician by training. So that's a subspecialty. I'm an internist. You can also be family medicine. So geriatricians think of themselves kind of as taking care of comprehensively the whole older adult and tend to think about safety issues. It's been an area of my interest personally for, for years. I'm the medical director of a home care agency, so that's something where the nurses go out to the home and the physical therapist, and I'm the only doctor. So I see kind of older adults in the community from really a different vantage point than many others do. And I work with all different kinds of medical and allied professionals. And so this has been an area, as, as Bob mentioned, hearing, I think about, I've been interested in burns in older adults in the community for years, um, falls for years. And the problem is, is that physicians and medical professionals tend to be very siloed. So then if you take it even the next step, then we're going to go from physicians, all the whole medical field, include lawyers, include public, you know, the whole area of all of the interactions that affect how someone's managing. We're talking about primarily people in the community, in and out of going to the hospital, going to a nursing home, coming back home, all of the what we call transitions of care has is, is really very complicated. And geriatricians, I mean, it's kind of what we do, but it a lot of people don't think about it. And so when Bob approached me about this, it was like, this is exactly what geriatricians like to think about. So you asked about specific terms, and some of this, it changes over time. Age-friendly has become a specific term. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, along with the Hartford Foundation and American Catholic Association, started a movement saying, Health systems don't put older adults in the center and they tend to have negative impacts when they get in the, in the healthcare systems. And so health systems need to think about older adults. And there's something called the four M's, which is mentation. Uh, so that you have to think about mobility, mentation, medication, and what matters to me. So that there are four M's and we need to think about them in all care settings and put the patient in the middle around that. So patient-centered care overlaps with age-friendly. Age-friendly is kind of a term now coined by large organizations. So my Montefiore is on a journey to become certified as age-friendly in different care settings. Age, the, the patient-centered is saying, you have to ask someone what, what, what's important to them. You have to put the you can't treat every 90 year old the same. You have to, you know, in a certain sense, there's a kind of a homogeneity about a three year old. Most three year olds, unless God forbid there's something wrong, are similar, right? They need the same stages, they need the same things. But old, adults age so differently that you look at one 90, 90 year old and another 90 year old, and they're so profoundly different that we have to put who they are, where they're at, at the center of how we take care of them. So that's really what. Uh, those terms mean. Um, and so then when you think about the, the way we thought about the book is, and we thought about all the different aspects of life that interact and that people don't always know about it. People don't, I've learned just from writing this, editing this book from disciplines where all they do is one piece of it to say, we, we need to think about this because to be able to prevent something that you, 
if you'd known more, you could have prevented is, is really staggering and that we don't do that as a society. So certain things have become very important, right? So everyone focuses on, well, I shouldn't say everyone focuses on false. We should all be focusing on false because it's such a huge opportunity as a society, as older adults fall. But I still every day in my practice in the Bronx have people where I'm like, you're kidding, you know, you are at risk. This is what you need to do. And like the whole community needs to be able to do that. So that that's an easy, it falls in a sense or, or an easy example because there's good data, there's good protocols, that there's kind of a whole community of, of researchers and uh, agencies working on it. But there are many other pieces of this that aren't as many people working on it together. So we really need to, we, we wanted to edit this book to try to get as many different voices together. And now we have a whole list of all the voices we didn't ask that next time around, we're going to ask for those voices. And every day I wake up and go, boy, we didn't put in this voice. And, you know, people, so, so we're going to have version two with the next voices that we left out. I want to throw in one other phrase, term, reframing aging. So reframing aging is a movement to stop stereotyping older adults because it affects equity of healthcare. If you think of, although that older patient isn't going to listen, that older patient is going to understand, it deprives them of a full interaction with a medical professional. And in writing the book, so reframing aging stops portraying all older adults as frail and vulnerable and helpless. So one of the challenges in writing the books, and as, as Amy said, older adults are very different. Every 90-year-old adult is very different in terms of their physical ability, their mental ability. So we asked every author to, to, tr- to use the term older adults, not elderly not talk about the silver tsunami that is going to overwhelm society. Um, So a book about safety for older adults is very different than writing a book about infant or child safety because older adults are presumed to be independent, presumed to be competent, presumed to have abilities, whereas, as Amy pointed out, small children could be presumed to not understand and need you to intervene. Do you see this book use, being used in medical schools? <laughs> I would wish. So I would. So one of the issues is is to get geriatrics in the curriculum of every medical school. So you talk about that. I, I, I talk because there's my my experience in in the work that I do in Jewish sacred aging, and talking to some geriatricians, geriatric specialists. They keep telling me. Very few people are going into this field, yet the demographics are like skewed, but fewer people. Why? 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 Well, the, the, I, I don't know if we want to go on divergent fields. So those are many different questions. I, I know. Unfortunately, the way we've structured healthcare in, this, in the United States, there's not a lot of, right? It's the same question for primary care. So the question is, is that there's a, in, there's a nationwide shortage of geriatricians. We need to, and with as we're having the demographic needs them, we do both primary care. So I have an old uh, cohort of patients that you take care of, as well as consultative geriatrics. There's a desperate need for more geriatricians uh, in the United States, and it's something that our society, the American Geriatric Society, is working on. You know, it becomes how the healthcare system is structured. It's a complicated issue, um, and then you also want to have geriatrics training for every medical student, because what we say is whatever field you go into in, in, in medicine, you're going to be taking care of older adults. If you're a pediatrician, you're taking care of the grandparents who are unfortunately taking care of the children. Everyone's more taking more. care more and yeah. more. So, so everyone is taking care of older adults. So I go around, you know, I, I want every uh, physician at my, that I work with to understand the basic a structure of what services are available to older adults. Like I literally tell the surgeons, because in order to take care of older adults, you need to know what's available, who else is on the team, and how to make sure that the patients you t- take care of are getting the referrals and that the care that they need. And it's an ongoing challenge, um, you know, uh, for, for every day. Um, so, yeah, and, 
And Rich, there's a workforce issue. I mean, it's, it is absolutely true about geriatricians, but there's a workforce issue. So I work at a foundation. At our last meeting, agencies are returning grants because they can't hire the staff. Really? Yes. Um, and, you know, in my, in, in my field, when you meet somebody else in the field of helping older adults, you say, what brought you to this field? Because trust me, when they were 19 and thinking of what cool thing they were going to do when they got older, it, 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 it's rarely working with older adults and, and people often get there through side doors. I, I was lucky and had a fantastic mentor who was in the field and I just would have followed him anywhere. And then I realized it was an incredibly interesting, wonderful field filled with the best professionals I've ever encountered. I'm trained as a lawyer. I would so much rather be associated with people working with older adults. They are fine, wonderful people. Dr. Ehrlich um, epitomizes the kind of professionals who are working with older adults. The, there's a phrase that I was uh, once introduced to by uh, somebody I knew very, very well called um, third person invisible. Um, that <laughs> Dr. Ehrlich, see, how do we, over, in, in this society, you're talking about, Bob, uh, reframing aging and the fact that there still is an ageist element in the United States of America. Um, I remember being in a hospital room and visiting somebody, a physician would come in or somebody would talk they with the person lying in the bed and they would talk to the family member as about the care for this person who is alive and listening and very alert. How... How do we begin to deal with this? Because it almost is a societal restructuring that that 85, 90 year old, that it, they're not invisible, are they? They're, they're, they're human beings. Right. I mean, that, that's, that's, I mean, the IHIs would say we're saying what matters to me to be, I mean, we literally have boards now that we're putting up that you ask someone what matters to me so that people see people as people with, uh, a, a person, you know, other pieces of themselves. It's, the hospital is a very scary place. One of our chapters, you know, I'm a physician, so Bob has all kinds of other chapters, but one of the uh, chapters that I think everybody should read is called The Hazards of Hospitalization, which is correct, you get correct. into the hospital and what happens. And there's a series of hazards, some of them, you know, that are clearly documented. We know it happens. And anyone who's had someone they love in the hospital has seen these kinds of risks. And as people age, they're just that much more vulnerable to the hazards of hospitalization. And to me, that's, you know, these transitions when they go into the hospital and they're there, and then they're leaving the hospital and they're going somewhere else. What can we, what can we teach people to think about for the allied professionals to think about to prevent some of these preventable hazards of hospitalizations. It's really, I mean, if you're going to, as a physician, if you're going to read one of those, I would say read that and then also read the chapter. Well, the, all the chapters are important, but also the chapter about the risks of patients of older adults with cognitive impairment. What are the risks and what should we do about them? Because it's, it's staggering. And some of this we can do something about right? As a, as a society. And, and it, it's too late once there's been a crisis, right? There, there are crises that we can predict and we need to educate everyone about them so that we don't see these tragedies that we could have intervened on earlier. And that, that's what I find painful is to see something that if, where people say, if I had known, you know, if someone had told me, and it isn't just the doctors, it's the whole, it's the, the getting them to the community-based organizations are incredibly resourceful. I mean, in the Bronx, we have unbelievable depth of organizations to help people with cognitive impairment, to help older adults, and people need to use those resources and talk to the whole team there so that they learn what we can all do to prevent these tragedies. You know, one of the everybody with dementia should go home with a checklist of lock away the knives, lock away the car keys, lock away. And, you know, we all live in northeastern urban areas out there. There are millions of older adults with dementia who have got. Yes, uh, this goes to this is why we wanted to have this conversation about <laughs> exactly about the book. 
one of the other chapters, which I'm very happy that you included, um, how clinicians can support and prepare their patients regarding financial care. Uh, I, I was looking through the book and I said, wow, this is very, very interesting. And let's, let's, let's walk us through because the cost, what we call in, in the work that we do in Jewish sacred aging, the workshop on the economics of aging, um, that's very, 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 very real as, as, as both of you know. And you do have charts, right? I think on page 359, if I wrote them, my note correctly, um, on, uh, decoding things about Medicare and uh, insurance. Talk to me about that. How, how that chapter? Why that's so so important? So I want to say something wonderful about Dr. Erla. So I'm a lawyer. I should have thought of having that chapter in, but it was Dr. Erla who <laughs> deals with these issues daily with four older adults in the Bronx and just how you pay for care. She's the one that said, Bob. I realized we need to have a chapter on finance. And in fact, the way I met Dr. Ehrlich is her department, when they approached my foundation and said, here's what we need. And I said, oh, you need a lab thing? You need No, we need a social worker. We need somebody who could help older adults negotiate benefits, entitlements. I can give medical care. I can't put food in their pantry. So I'll let Dr. Earl take it from there, but it was her impetus. It, it is an extremely complicated issue. And so if people are really at the lower level of income and have Medicaid in New York and Medicare because they're older, they get a lot of services. But there are many, many people who work their entire lives who have Medicare only, who are entitled potentially to other services, and they don't know it. And and if you have cognitive impairment, it's very hard to negotiate this system. It's hard to figure it out. It's hard to have all the right paperwork. It's hard to know what you're entitled to. And it is a, I, I've been walking around, Bob, my, my colleagues are tired. I walk around the Bronx saying, this is an emergency. If somebody's entitled to services that they're not getting and they're aging and they're 87 and they now have diabetes, they had a stroke, and they're living in an apartment in the Bronx, and they don't get everything they're entitled to, it becomes a crisis. And that's when we see the kind of the safety net fall apart. And there are groups often we have in the Bronx, we're blessed, we have the Department for the Age, we have a lot of robust services, but how do you have people access them? Because as they become homebound, right, as it's harder to get out, as it's harder to reach your doctor's office, who who else do you know? And it, it's really striking. Um, and this isn't just, these are middle, these are people who work their whole lives. I mean, as you said, this is, these are, these are people who worked their entire lives and now they're 88 and they're frail and they can't manage without the help of another person. If they're blessed to have family that lives nearby, they live in a cooperative setting where there are other people, but not everyone has that, you know, not everyone has that that kind of network and how do they get paid help to keep them in the home i mean our goal always is to keep people living independently in the community as long as they can i mean that's always as a geriatrician what we want for people and that's what most people want i mean sometimes people can't maintain themselves in the community but i'm not talking about institutional care i'm saying being safe in the community and getting the resources and it's complicated and the thing that i would say if there's one message there are community-based organizations with expertise to help older adults learn about this and help them navigate it. Um, and uh, you have to find them um, and make a phone call and, and, and access that. Uh, people are just stunned by what's out there that they haven't accessed. And that is that, again, is one of the things that we should do as a community. Make I mean, they're reaching out, but people get isolated, right? You're frail, you live up a two-story, you know, an apartment, and you don't know it. And um, so that's part of the part of our challenges. And one of the things that I've seen, which is a wonderful piece of progress, is greater understanding and appreciation and funding to address social determinants of health. There's a greater understanding that if you want to improve health and safety, you have to think about housing, you have to think about food, you have to think about social contact. Those things are at have the same 
kind of effect on health and aging as blood pressure. They're, these are big issues. As people have cognitive impairment and dementia, which up to 30% of adults over the age of 85 in the community, it's ages to think that if you're 85, your thinking shouldn't be clear. If you have a disease of dementia, if you're 85, your thinking isn't clear. But once you're in the community, there are no physician can tell you everything you need to know about it, that there are very, very outstanding organizations helping patients with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias with a whole cohort of educators and support systems that people need to access immediately to get the help that they need, and they will help them navigate this as well. I'm not taking a different point of view from Dr. Ehrlich, but when you're 85, you even if you don't have dementia, you will likely have some loss of executive function. That is a normal progression of older adults. The you lose some ability, and it differs from older adult to do complicated calculation. And all older adults need to do complicated calculations because there's Medicaid and there's Medicare and Social Security and pension and and different savings accounts, and you're saving for your grandchildren, and it's a second marriage, and it, the complex the types of calculations you need to do are the most complicated in your life and you have less ability to do them. And if you've had the same financial advisor since you were 20, he or she probably has lost some of their edge as well. And that this isn't ages. This is just coming. Reality. It's reality. You will lose some of your executive functioning ability. Okay, Bob, yeah. I'm going to argue with you. I, can, I have Good. to argue with him. Can I argue okay, with him, great. Rabbi? Hey, go, go for it. Okay. Go for it. The problem that I see is, as a, as a society, as a medical society, we still don't recognize if people have mild cognitive impairment, we don't recognize 80% of that mild cognitive impairment. So the problem that I have is normal aging, you may have slowed response. It may take you longer to remember name, but your judgment is intact. Your ability to think things, something through remains intact. You may be a little slower to, you know, you go, oh, I snapped in. Oh, now I remember the name. But the problem that I have over and over again, and these are sophisticated families that a parent or a sibling is clearly has new cognitive impairment. And that needs to be named. It doesn't need to be said they're a little forgetful. They're a little this or that. We should name it so we know what it is, evaluate whether it's going to progress, because otherwise we do everyone a disservice. So, I know what you're saying, Bob, but I think it's very important, given how poor we are at recognizing cognitive impairment, to say that normal aging, your judgment, your intellectual ability remains the same. And if there's concern about that, you, it should be something that someone is thinks about and has evaluated by appropriate physician or team. On what you were discussing, talk to me about the element of fear. I, I don't want to, I, I know it, I should, but I'm afraid to deal with it because I'm afraid what the answers may be. So it may be easier to just ignore it and pass it off as, oh, a senior moment. Oh, it's just normal, normal happen. Everybody, you know, loses their keys, everyone. The fear factor, because I, I, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, everyone worries about it. I mean, I would, there are reversible pieces that people should know about, right? That there's a medical evaluation if someone's got cognitive impairment. So you don't want to miss something that you could change. You don't want to be taking a medicine that's in, in pin, that's having an impact on your ability to your your thinking. So you really, first of all, you don't want to miss that there's something you could do something about. And second, if you're at risk for doing some a progression, you want to know about it so that the most important thing that we don't have any great medicines, but what we do have is prevention for some of the different pieces that. Bob and I think about. So what you don't want to do is be at risk for falling. You don't want to be at risk for other preventable injuries that if you identified the problem and were clear about it, you could uh, have an intervention. So I, I encourage people to think about it. And, and, and it is the, Alzheimer's is the most feared disease among older adults. They fear it much more than cancer or anything else. By the way, just to pick up on the last thing that Amy said, uh, just a practical piece of advice. When, if you're a caregiver, walk 
through your parents' home, room by room with them. If they drive, take a drive with them. See how they drive. Or, or, you know, ask them to get someplace that they don't go to every day. Do they get lost? I think going through a little bit of their life with them, seeing what's in the refrigerator, seeing are there a pile of unpaid bills in right. the trash can, I think those things you pick up danger signs. Um, and I think it's important to do. You know what my favorite <laughs> one is? What? Well, I, you know, for the holidays, everyone keeps the holiday dishes up high in the Bronx, right? Because you only have so much st- space. So they climb ladders and they oh, climb. That's, that's, yes, right, that's yes. a New York City thing. So I say, let me see you stand on one foot for 10 seconds. And if you can't, air of whatever holiday, get your kids over there to get the dishes down. Because if you can't stand on the, uh, one leg, you shouldn't be climbing ladders for the holidays. Listen, there are a lot of people who will listen to this or watch this. They're not living in Philly. They're not living in Boston or New York. They're living in, in, in all, all, all over the world, literally, or, you know, in North America. Somebody may be listening to this and, and living this with a, a, a parent. Where, where do they go to get answers to this uh, other than reading their book, your, your book? What, where do they, you know, where, where do they go to get, you know, there's so much you have you just in reading the book, there's like eight, nine, 10 issues, falls, strokes, isolation, suicide, sleep, dementia, substance abuse, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm a care. Where, do, where can I go to get some help with all this stuff? Cause I'm, I'm really concerned. Are there places in variety in, in communities? Where, where would yes. I go? Where would I go? I mean, I tell people where whatever community you live in, there is the Department for the Aging is where you start so that there's a Department for the Aging and they will have well, they will know your local resources. I mean, the there's also the all there's I don't know if you name all the different, but that's a government. Those are state right. government agencies, area agencies on aging. Right. There are areas of aging in every state. And I when people don't know where to start, it is a place to start. I mean, clearly there are religious organizations. There are lots of other places to go, but that you can uniformly start there. And then there are, I mean, now that we're online, there are fantastic large organizations around Alzheimer's disease, dementia, that also have a lot of resources and a lot of ability. But if you need concrete help where you are, it's a place to start. Would you agree, Bob? Yes, I, mean, I know you could do, Yeah. Sorry, Rabbi. No, no, no. And I know there are places because I've talked to couples and individuals and just say, you know, you can go online, uh, and Google, you know, uh, uh, making my house safe for falls and taking the throw rug in the bathroom that in the middle of the night, somebody could trip over. And the next thing they know, you're dealing with them in the ER, uh, with a broken hip, which as you know, which we don't have to go into. People know. Uh, before we start running out of time, a couple of more things I want to bounce off of you from the book. Uh, you do have a chapter here on uh, assistive technologies. And now I'm fascinated as the caregiving explosion continues and as this new life stage continues. And now we're being introduced to the wonderful world of artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, I like your, your guys take on how important and how uh how do you see this revolution this emerging revolution in robotics as an as an assist to people especially living alone and there's increasing numbers of people uh uh, who are isolated and living alone uh do you see this as a a very valuable tool to uh, for the safety and security of older adults so there there is an explosion in technology so I'm wearing an Apple Watch. The reason I have an Apple Watch is because of my wife who fell and has a pacemaker and our geriatrician said, get an Apple Watch. It has fall detection and it takes her EKG and sometimes her pacemaker gets wonky and she can text it to our geriatrician who can say, it's nothing or you should really go to the emergency room now um people 
with mobility issues could use Alexa or Google to just comfort care, turn on lights, turn on the TV, call their daughter. Those are wonderful things. Eventually, maybe there'll be self-driving cars, which will help a lot of older adults regain their lives if they can't drive. Um, the, we are on a video call now. Zoom calls have changed the lives of older adults. You know, the um, Surgeon General just did an advisory on social isolation. Right, right. right. And he wrote a great book on it, too. There's something about interacting with your family if you're lucky enough to have people in your life. Those things make a big difference. Uh, I, by the it, way, I have a cute 10 second cute story, which is somebody who programmed their mother's Alexa to do all these things. And she said, It's not making the apartment hotter. She goes, Well, you live in an apartment building, it doesn't control the heat in your apartment. She kept calling her. It's not controlling the heat. So she programmed Alexa when she says, I'm cold to say, put on a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then knowing the Alexas, they probably listen to everything you're saying anyway, or somebody in some garage in El Segundo is. Um, in the 12th century, uh, Moses Maimonides, a physician of note, uh, wrote a series of uh, one of his essays, I think, on the preservation of youth. Uh, talking about the necessity of exercise and aerobic movements. And I keep reading in the work that we do in one of the workshops that we do on health and wellness about the importance, no matter how old you are, of bodily movement. Um, you're talking about minimizing risk, safety, how important it is to get off the couch and do something, keep moving. Is that directed at me? I mean, it's the number one. When people, I see, it's the number one thing that you can do to preserve your well-being really? and health. It's it's huge, but the problem is you have to do it safely. So if you haven't been doing it, you can't go and do something on your own, not with supervision, right? So that if you're frail and have issues, then your Medicare covers a physical therapist to have you do it. If you're really frail and falling at home, Medicare pays for someone to come into your home and help you. If you're not frail and you want to wear your Apple Watch, you shouldn't just be wandering slowly down. You know, I'm like, put on your sneakers, find a flat place, go to the mall where you won't trip. I mean, it gets more complicated where you're going to do right. it. But there is good support for older adult exercises. Like in the Bronx, they have Tai Chi, they have exercise, you know, chair yoga, Tai Chi in the parks, all kinds of different programs. But the issue is to figure out how to get motivated, how to do it, and how to do it safely. And, and and anybody in the field will tell you that falls is the biggest preventable issue. It's, it's either the low hanging fruit or the low falling fruit. But no it, fall. it, 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 but it, it's it's there are lots of things people can do, um, including wearing proper footwear, um, not having the person who cleans your house shine your floors so that they're sparkly and slippery. There is. There's just tons of literature that you can get from the internet and then walk through the house, have a checklist. Do you have grab bars? Do, you know, are things not, as Amy pointed out, do you need a step stool to get to your dishes? There are, it's so preventable and there, I'm, there are millions of older adults who fell and their lives never were the same hey, after that. Next, next to the last quick question. Uh, we keep reading uh, uh, more and more articles about as we get older, the importance of sleep. Could you just comment on that? I mean, for is it, it, how important is getting that seven, eight hours for one's own safety and security? Okay. As we age, our sleep is more fragmented. So people who have trouble sleeping, some of that goes along with aging. Mm -hmm. The sleep aids, many of them are dangerous, increase falls, increase confusion, and have problems. So it's a whole it, that's a whole segment unto itself uh, to talk it about. Should be the, it should be a chapter in the next book. It, it should be right. So it it's the 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 Benadryls are sedating, they lead to more falls, they lead to more problems. So there's all kinds of things that people do incorrectly to try to have 
sleep that they may not be able to get the way they were when they were young. And so it's a whole, wow. it's really an hour discussion. Well, no, that uh, just one of the things you mentioned about these, this over the, over the, the over the counter sleep aids may not be as beneficial if I'm in my seventies and if I'm in my twenties. Uh, well, which, yeah, they're dangerous. I mean, there are which the, most people. Yeah. I will tell you, most people have no idea because they just see it on TV. I, I, I need to get a night's sleep. I'll go pop a NyQuil or, uh, the, or whatever. There's something called the Beers Criteria, Beers List of medications that the American Geriatric Society puts out. That is number one, two, and three. People should not take over-the-counter sleep aids that have diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl in them, because the side effect Whoa. profile is very serious in older adults. You may just have saved a lot of people a lot of aggravation right there. And let me do a quick commercial for three things as we're wrapping up. The annual wellness exam is free. Medicare pays for it. Every older adult should have an annual wellness exam, and it will hopefully pick up some of the things that Dr. Ehrlich were talking about. Have a fire safety plan. Fires, older adults die in fires more than younger people. How many families have a fire exit plan, or how many home care workers have thought about a fire safety plan. And if an older adult needs it, a personal emergency response system, someplace that they push a button, if they wear it on their watch, it's hanging on the wall where they can call for help if they need it. Those, all of those things save life. I don't know. Uh, Amy, no, that's add a couple of quick low hanging fruit in there. You can't leave it on the wall. You got to wear it around your neck yeah, or you have it on your body because then right, you right. fall. We don't find you for I, 24 hours. Sure. No, no, I just, I, I just dealt with a family. It's great. It's weird that you mentioned this, but I just dealt with a family where that exact same thing happened. This individual, older woman, um, late eighties fell. She didn't, she had a device, but it was on the counter. And it was, you know, it was just going to sleep. She put it on the counter. She got up to go, I think, to use the lavatory, fell, could not get back to the device. And so that's like these last, you've probably saved some people's lives. Also, so, um, also, this is also good but, light. Lighting is important. And there yes, are devices that go under the bed. When you get up to go to the bathroom, they detect your legs. And they light your path to the bathroom. I and think steps. The most fantastic invention of all time. Uh, a comprehensive guide to safety and aging, minim minimizing risk, maximizing security, um, along with uh, Barry Ecker. These are the editors, Robert Wolf and uh, Dr. Amy Ehrlich. Uh, I want to thank you. And the suggestion, because I looked through the book as I was reading through the book, and I just, I did not see that chapter on the impact of faith and spirituality. Um, so on the sequel, may I, may I put a plug in because as, as somebody who plays in that ballpark, we found that that's kind of important every once in a while. So, um, very uh, much good luck with this. Really, this is as, as we've just discussed, we could, as, as you guys have said, there's about four or five other issues at least that we could spend another hour on walking people through. Please, um, listen to what you've heard. If you have questions, go to that area of age on agency, area agency on aging, Alzheimer's association, the various, uh, associations. Go online, do your due diligence. You'll save a life. Could be yours. Um, Dr. Ehrlich, Bob, thank you very, very much. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, good luck with this book. It's great. It's great. And, uh, let me know when the movie comes out too. Take care, guys. And thank to all you. of you, thank you very, very much again for the privilege of uh, joining us. And we really appreciate it. We appreciate your time and interest. Again, if you'd like to make a comment or suggestion, email me, Rabbi Address at jewishsacredaging.com. If you'd like to help support our work, go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com, and just scroll down to the conveniently located Donate button. Follow the prompts. If you'd like to become a sponsor, as we've had uh, several times during the past year, also, just email me. We'll follow up with that. We appreciate 
very, very much your interest. And again, a reminder that the Secrets of Meaning podcast and TV is produced at the studios of Lubeck and Media Companies here in beautiful Southern New Jersey. And we give thanks to our producer, Steve Lubetkin, the web genius of all times. Again, thank you very much for joining us. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. And until we see each other again on the next Seekers of Meaning, be kind to one another, stay safe. Shalom. Thank you very much. <laughs>